Five, four, three, two, one. Pop short. Hello everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the One Puck Short Podcast. It is Wednesday the 13th of January 2016 and I am your host, Rob McGregor. Joe Yearden of NHL.com will be joining me shortly to talk about the Buffalo Sabres season, but a couple of news and noteworthies I wanted to bring up. First, Anze Kopitar is on the verge of signing a 10-year, $80 million deal with the Los Angeles Kings. Um, this has obviously been one that's kind of lingered for a little while. People wondered when it would get done and... It seemed like things are grown to a halt a little bit. Uh, this morning, UK time, Darren Dredger reported there had been some movement on Tuesday. And then sure enough, as the day rolled by, Bob McKenzie tweeted out the 10-year, $80 million figures. Uh, it seems like a pretty decent deal for Kopitar and the Kings, to be fair. He's their number one centre. I don't know if you people have drawn up the point where, well, he doesn't score many points. It's not all about points. Kopitar is such a driver of possession and offense and such a great suppressor on defense as well that you know this, this isn't purely about goals and assists this is much more for Los Angeles and you know he's he's been the number one center for two cup wins now and he'll be signed until he's 36 which isn't horrendous you know he could still be playing then so it's not like they're going to get stung at the back end so that's a big one for, for LA I know it hung over situation what it does for Stephen Stamkos contract negotiations nobody really knows at this point a few people have speculated whether he was waiting to happen with Kopitar whether he will get more whether he'll get less whether he's worth the same and all this sort of discussion comes up uh, all I'll say is despite what I said about points goals are expensive that is one point to, to be aware of again it's not just about points I keep stressing that but again if Stamkos is going to put up 40 goals a year well you know, he's going to be pushing for, for top dollar to do that. It's not easy to find a 40-goal scorer of Stephen Stamkos' ilk or even a 50-goal scorer. So, yeah, that was a, an interesting one to, to see how that moves the market for, for a few others as well. And obviously it gets Los Angeles sorted down the middle for the foreseeable future. That was one of their big pending free agents. Uh, Travis Yost and I did touch on their cap situation on Sunday's episode. You know, this is big money. It had to be done. It needed to be done. But it does raise the question again of how Los Angeles will manage their cap moving forward. It is a big investment. It's a worthwhile investment, $8 million per year for Copitar. But we will see how it works out and, and what the Kings do now to, to keep themselves under the cap next season when they could really feel the pinch, depending on how a few other things work out. In financial terms, the other story I wanted to mention is the falling Canadian dollar. Uh, it was down to... 69 cents against the US dollar. Now, all salaries in the NHL are paid in US dollars. Most people have speculated that the Canadian franchises would have hedged these deals just in case of an economic downturn like this. And you can imagine that they would have done that. And the bigger query is how this affects revenues in general. Obviously, the Rogers TV deal with the NHL will be in Canadian dollars. So if the value of the loony, as they call it, drops, that could affect hockey-related revenues, which in turn affects the cap. So it's not necessarily the most interesting story to keep an eye on economically, but it is one that could affect a lot of teams. Again, the Kings may come under that if the cap doesn't go up by much or at all. So uh, one to keep an eye on, I think, moving forward. As I said, it's early days yet to, to be worried about the cap for next season. It's only January, but uh, a story many people will be monitoring just in case. OK, so we'll have a quick advert, and then Joe Yudin from NHL.com will be joining me. One Puck Short is brought to you in association with Eastside Hockey Manager, an in-depth ice hockey management simulation brought to you by Sports Interactive and Sega, developers of the world-famous Football Manager series, available now for PC via Steam. Joining me now on the One Puck Short podcast, the Buffalo Sabres correspondent for NHL.com. Please welcome to the show Mr. Joe Yearden. Hi Joe, how are you? I'm doing great, Rob. Good to talk to you. Yeah, and gee, thanks for taking the time out to join me today. Uh, as I said, you're the correspondent for the Sabres for NHL.com. We'll, we'll jump in with them in, in a minute. But uh, there was a, a slight moment of amusement for a lot of Sabres fans today when Zach Cassian was recalled by Edmonton at the same time as Cody Hodgson was put on waivers by the Nashville Predators. What, what do you make of these particular moves? Well, it's um, 
I have to say for Cody, it's it's unfortunate. Uh, he was he was a guy who was always very pleasant to deal with and very you know worked worked his tail off and had a you know he had one great season with Buffalo where he scored scored twenty, had forty points, and was a seemed like he was projecting on an on an upward scale. And then then last season happened, and nobody in Buffalo had a good season aside from maybe Tyler Ed, but. Uh, things did not go well, and you know, with geez, what four or five more years left on that contract, they had to uh, they had to make a decision, and buying him out was the right move. And you know, then you look back on that trade. You know, everybody always likes to look back on trades and say, you know, right, who won, who lost. But pretty fair to say both Vancouver and Buffalo lost that trade because nothing good came out of either Cassian or Hudson switch swapping addresses, and nothing good came for Cassian in Vancouver for for the most part, and yeah. certainly Hodgson said yeah. Buffalo wasn't good. Do you think this is the end of the road for Cody Hodgson? Was, was this like the last chance saloon in Tennessee? Well, you know, I, I want to say that this is... I want to say that somebody else is going to give him a shot. I mean, he's... His advanced stats in Nashville were pretty good. I mean, if, you know, if, if you want to judge him solely mm. on, the, on possession numbers and, you know, how things work for him there, I mean, it, you, you can... Use that, and, and maybe he can plug into a situation where you know you you have a a spot where you need to improve and improve possession. Maybe you need somebody to carry in. Maybe he's that kind of guy. But you know, for a player of Hodgson caliber, you know he's always going to be thought of as somebody who needs to score goals and has to score tons of points and has to do this, that, and the other thing. And I just don't know if I don't know that he's going to get that shot now. I think it, maybe he goes to Mil- maybe he has to go to Milwaukee and dominate there, and things will get better for him. In that respect, but you know, uh, you know, maybe if there's somebody who's a little bit more savvy with with the with the advanced stats and and is willing to get their GM zero about it, then you know that 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 might that might turn into something for him. But right now, I have to say, probably not much happening for him. Yeah, I, mean, I guess in in some senses, it kind of reminds me a little bit of, of Sam Gagne. Maybe this is a guy who who has some upside. He could help a team, but it's difficult to see where he fits in right now, which is a shame because. Yeah, I quite like watching Cody Hodgson play. I hope to a turn around for him in Nashville, but uh, things just sadly haven't worked out for him. But let's switch back and focus on on the Sabres, as, as I said at the top of the show. That's uh, why I invited you on today to to talk about the way things are shaping up in Buffalo. Uh, currently twenty eighth overall, which isn't tremendous in those terms, but I think there's been signs of real improvement in Buffalo this season. Yeah, there there absolutely have, and yeah, it's it's. Interesting to see how fans are reacting to things, and you know, with with how the you know with how the losses have kind of piled up a little bit this season. A lot of fans have been wondering if you know if maybe with you know Austin Matthews, they're kind of lurking as you know the prize for for getting the first pick. People were wondering if this is you know the opportunity for for tank part two, but you know that's it, certainly not in the planning for this team. I mean, it, it, they're parts of this team are, are playing very well. And I think when you look at it on the whole, guys like Reinhardt and Eichel and Ristolainen are playing very well. And those are the guys you want to see playing very well. And I think for for Buffalo it's you know, they're doing a lot of the things better. You know, they're 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 playing a better game. They're pay, playing a better brand of hockey and yeah. they're they're doing things where it's you know, it's a little bit easier to get by. So, you know, I think for them it's it, it's a situation where you know, a lot of they've had a lot of nights where they've run into uh, the hot goalie, or they've run into a team that's won seven, eight, nine in a row, and you're thinking like, well, when are we going to catch a break here? And I, and, you know, I know for a lot of Sabres fans and players, they're probably thinking that. I mean, you know, you roll into a road trip, you know, the, the Western Canada trip turned, in, turned into a nightmare because everybody they played yeah. was on a winning streak. You know, Vancouver, Calgary, and Edmonton, all of them were you know, rolling off wins and. You know it, that road trip is already hard enough, and then you you know you go out there and everybody's playing well, and it's you know it's different things like that where you know, if you want to be the eternal pessimist, you can <laughs> and you get away with it, and that's that's fine. But I think for the team, you know, there, there's lots of guys that are playing very well, and you know on the flip side of that, a lot of guys that aren't playing very well, and that's that's where the problems come in. Yeah, I, I mean, we well, use as a segue maybe to move on to to Evander Kane. It says that high profile trade that came about a year ago, almost to the day he, he missed the end of last season, recovering from shoulder surgery. But he's been a little bit slow out the blocks with the Sabres, eight goals, fifteen points, and it's. I guess a lot of people expected him maybe to come out firing in all cylinders to prove people wrong, especially the recent game in Winnipeg where he just kind of 
you know, got on with it and played the game and obviously set Sam Reinhardt up for his first career hat-trick. So what's been the assessment of Evander Kane so far in Buffalo? You know, he's, he's another guy who's doing a lot of the things right, and he's been snake bitten by, by bad luck. I mean, you, know, you look back, you look at that game in, um, geez, what game am I thinking of here? Um, the game in Chicago mm-hmm. where he gets a break in against Corey Crawford, and he's got Crawford dead to rights. Crawford's down in the splits, you know, sitting on his sitting on his backside, and you know he's got him, got him beat. If he shoots it anywhere above the silhouette of Crawford sitting in the net, and instead he goes to go for the top corner and ends up putting it off the post. And you know, there's been a lot of instances like that. And you know, I asked before they went out on this past road trip, I asked Biles about, you know, what his assessment of the uh, of Evander's play is, and. You know, he said, I, you know, I have still pictures in my mind of opportunities that Evander's had that just haven't gone yeah. his way. And, you know, that when, when you've got things like that where, you know, things just aren't, aren't going your way, that's a tough break. But, you know, when it, when it comes to him, it's, you know, he's going to get a lot of the attention. He's going to get a lot of the drama. And, you know, fair or not, that, that's part of the deal. But, you know, you're going to get the season. He said, there's no reason why I can't, can't score 30 or 40. Hey, even push fifty goals, and you know he's sitting sitting at what nine, ten now. So oh, eight, yeah, you know, yeah, eight, yeah. So it's you know it's it's one of those things where you know he sets the bar really high for himself, and things haven't exactly gone that way. So you know, but the chances have been there. I think if the chances weren't there, there'd be a bigger problem. But they they have been there. But this entire team, the chances have been there, and a lot of them just haven't capitalized. Yeah. Uh, another player who arrived over the summer is Ryan O'Reilly. He currently leads the team in points with 37. He's averaging the second highest amount of time on ice per game behind Rasmus Ristolainen. Uh, what has he brought to the table and how much does he mean to this team moving forward? Oh, O'Reilly's been their best player. I mean, he's, he's the team MVP by far. And, you know, for for the, the attention that was brought to him with the trade and then the contract extension, I think for everybody that, that saw this is that, all right, man, you got to produce because, you know, this time in Colorado, he showed him, you know, he produced pretty well. I don't know if the bar was set higher for him for one reason or another, or, you know, or what the, what the case was, but I think for him, it, he's, he's done everything that they've asked for of him and he's been great. And I think, you know, head and shoulders, he's been their best player. I mean, you know, 17 goals, he's their all-star. He's their guy that, that is handling all the tough situations. He's, top power play unit, the top penalty killer. He's the top everything as far as this team. I mean, it's, he's been everything that you'd hope for out of a guy that you gave the biggest contract in the franchise history. I think he's been spectacular. Yeah. Moving towards the, the back end or the defensive end, uh, Robin Lane is due to return from injury or, or is just about to. You know, what does this mean for, for Lane and probably for Linus Allmark as well, who I think has performed pretty well for the Sabres between the pipes when he's been called on? Well, I think Linus has done outstanding. I think he's he's done better than I think anybody expected of him, considering he came off double hip surgery and was playing his first season in North America against you know you know pros probably better than he faced in Sweden. And mm-hmm. you know I, I think for for him getting kind of thrown to the wolves, in, you know, in that situation, you know, because you know Nathan Lewin was was not the guy that they could count on, and, and you know Chad Johnson, you need somebody to to yeah. spell him because if he get, if he wears out, then you're then you're in trouble. <laughs> Big trouble. So, you know, the the way the the rotation worked, where it was basically a straight alternation, you know, all, you know, alternating starts for Johnson and Olmark. I think Olmark was great for for Leonard. He's got to be the guy to carry the load here the second half, and I, not just because he's you know he's the number one guy, but because they got to know what they have. You know, they 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 made that big trade for him, and you know he he was brought in with the expectation he's going to be the number one, and now you're not sure because he's played in. Well, I've won two, two and a half games since last February. And, you know, you, you got to know what exactly he's bringing to the table. And the only way that's good, you're going to find that out is by more starts. I think for him, it's, it's a, it, it's the same thing I said back in September. It's a great opportunity for him. And, you know, if he seizes it and, and takes the number one job, that's better for the Sabres and it's better for him. Because when it comes time to, to, to redo that, to get the new contract in a couple of years, you know, that's, that, that, that's got to be, it's going to be the thing everybody's going to be is going to be looking at is how he handled being being the number one with a bullet. 
Yeah, and that's a big opportunity for, for Lena, as you said, because things didn't go as well as, as he may have hoped in Ottawa. This is a, a great opportunity for him on, on an emerging club, really. And, and Tim Murray's kind of echoed the, the sentiments you and I have touched on already, that things are improving, that the club seems happy with, with the way things are shaping up, even though the record in the standings it isn't particularly great but there is also talk they will be sellers again at the deadline they will listen to offers on Tyler Ennis apparently which surprised me a little he's only 26 he's got three years left on his contract which comes with a cap hit of 4.6 million dollars per season he's a three-time 20 goal scorer and a guy who seemed to fit quite nicely in this lineup is it just that he is someone who is perceived to have sufficient value to help fill a hole elsewhere in the lineup moving forward well, Tyler's case is fascinating to me because he was so great the last two seasons when the team was, was just awful. Mm-hmm. And you know, he was the glimmer of hope. He was the guy that you're, that a lot of people were hitching their star to to say, you know, once, once Reinhardt gets here, once, you know, once they drafted mm-hmm. Eichel, once Eichel gets, gets into the lineup, you know, Tyler Ennis is going to take off. He's going to go from being that 20, 20 goal, 45, 50 point guy to being the 30 goal, 60 point guy. You know, I mean, it was, I think that was a logical assumption to make that, you know, a guy with his skill set and his ability and, and, you know, and the fact that he's proven it over the years, I think that was just a logical assumption to make. And, you know, whether it was, you know, whether it was the injuries, you know, him playing through injury or, yeah. or if it was just the case of, of things just not, him not fitting into what Dan Biles was looking for, or maybe he just doesn't mesh well with the new guys that were brought in. Something's gone horribly wrong. With Ennis, and you know the fact they're listening, you know that it's come out that they're listening to trades. I wonder, wonder if maybe that they were keeping an ear to the ground earlier in the season, and that mm-hmm. that now make that maybe, maybe Tim Murray's maybe dangling him out there in an order in order to get something else to get somebody else out there, or you know maybe he's maybe there's a part of a, a deal that's going to be coming coming soon where you know if you can't move a guy like you know Mike Weber or Carlo Koliak or whatever it is. Yeah, if you can't move a guy like that. Maybe if you tag Tyler Ennis along, you can make a deal happen either. Hmm. I mean, is there a particular a- area of the roster you think the Tim Murray would like to improve on? And just looking at the the lineup, you know, I'm not wild about the blue line. I, I have to be frank. Is that going to be a consideration both at the trade deadline and potentially at the draft with, with someone like Jacob Chikrin up for grabs? Well, they, he, Tim Murray's been looking for a top four left handed defenseman since, well, since the draft out of Florida. And they're they're not very easy to come by. No. You know, it always it seemed like when Mike Babcock was on was on the warpath of Detroit looking for a top right handed defenseman, it seemed like they were impossible to find. Now it's the left handed defenseman that, you know, if you want a guy that's gonna get top four minutes, you know, you might have to make a trade that's really uncomfortable. And I think at that point, you know, maybe over the summer it was, you know, people were asking about Tyler Ennis. Like if you're looking to take you know, if you're looking to take a high talent guy or a high high salary guy. Maybe, you know, maybe that's what they're asking for in return. And then maybe you're saying like, well, I don't know about that. Tyler's been really good. Let's see how things work. And maybe those things have uh, come back, come back and, and bit them a little bit. But I, 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 to me, the top four lefty defenseman is, is the biggest one. I think, I think they would obviously like to get more scoring. You know, they, they you know, they, they did their research on Jonathan Drew, but you know, you just don't know what Drew going to do if you plug him into this lineup. But, you know, he would obviously help, but you know, yeah. it's just a matter of what cost is going back, going back to Tampa. But I think for, I think for 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 what he's looking for, what Murray would ideally like to get, it's I think it's that that top top end left handed defenseman. I think that's that's his top top need right now, and that's what he wants to get done. Mm. Just moving away, or, or talking in a more general sense about the Buffalo Sabres, I know I, I, that sometimes people look, look at the Sabres and when they were in the Winter Classic a few years ago, and, and they kind of necessarily don't understand that that Buffalo moves the needle in terms of TV ratings. And even though the Sabres have been bad for a few years, or, or they had a few downturns, even when Miller and Vanek were there, they maybe weren't as competitive they had been in the past. But, you know, interest in the Buffalo Sabres has always been high in the local area. What is it about the team that seems to engage with the local community there so much and generate all this interest? I think the the, the city just loves their sport, their sports teams. They, you know, the, the at least the major sports teams. They, they certainly have a lot of love for the Buffalo Bisons, the you know, AAA baseball team. But when it comes to the Bills and Sabres, it's a whole different story. And the fans really get behind these teams. And, you know, you look back when, you know, when the, the bills were up for sale and there was some question as to whether or not they were going to stay in Buffalo and the fans just, you know, well, you know, went crazy. About that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think the, the same thing happened with the Sabres years ago before Tom Golisano bought, 
bought the team and and saved them from from maybe a similar fate back in back in the early 2000s mid 2000s but you know it, it's it's one of those things where you know the 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 support for these clubs is so huge here because it's you know it's it's all part of pride here it's a little different from the bigger cities where they have a ton of teams and, and you know it, it's you know it's something where I think for I think for the fans here, they they really get behind all of it. They love you know they love these teams. I think that that shows through and how much how much the griping happens on Twitter or or the <laughs> uh, if, you know once the winning starts, the the chest thumping starts. Then. So I think for I think for them, it's just, it's just one of those points of pride. And it's, that's the city is so desperate for a champion. Yeah. You know, for for a major league major sports league champion, it's it's you know I think if you get a team that that started pushing pushing for that again like if the Bills get back in the playoffs and go deeper if the Sabres make a deep run in the playoffs you're going to see that come back with a with a, with a huge amount of passion yeah I mean it's a kind of a, a let's call it a five year plan maybe or, or similar where I mean the, the Hockey News pegged the Sabres as the winner of the Stanley Cup in 2020 I know it was a hypothetical kind of piece that Ken Campbell did and they did one of the Winnipeg winning in 2019 all this kind of stuff but is there that kind of almost ballpark time or year when they say you know we well, you want to be competing for a cup by date or date x you know it, it, is it a f- sort of five-year plan do they believe they can get there quicker you know, is there that kind of feeling or is it just it'll happen when it happens um i think i think with with eichel arriving and with reinhardt here and risk the line and emerging as a number one defenseman i think i think that you know, when, when, and, you know, after you make the Kane trade and after you make the O'Reilly trade, I think, I think a lot of people in their mind felt that, well, you know, some people were thinking playoffs right away, which you know, I think <laughs> yeah. was very, very premature and, sure. and that's, you know, short sighted to the max. But I think, I think you have to make the playoffs next season. I think mm-hmm. that absolutely has to be the, the move. And then after that, you've got like a three to five year window where, you know, the, you know, playoffs are kind of the crapshoot where, you know, if things break right, you can make it to the to, to the Stanley Cup final, and I think that's I think that's ultimately what it is. Just get to the playoffs and see how things go from there. And I, I think that's where the Cup window comes in. Obviously, when when Eichel and Reinhardt and Ristolainen hit their absolute primes in that you know the twenty two to twenty six, twenty seven year old age for, yeah. age range, I think that's that's when you need to be winning it by. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that. So Jack Eichel, no secret really coming into the season, he was going to be a big star and a big part of the Sabres moving forward. And he's had a pretty good rookie season so far. But it, it interests me that you mentioned uh, Rasmus Ristolainen as a potential number one defenseman for this team. He's had a great year. He leads the team in average time on ice per game. And he's just been out, outstanding at the back. Uh, he's an RFA in the summer. I don't think that's going to be an issue for Tim Murray to lock him up long term for big money. They've got the cap space. Terry Pagula's happy to stump up the cash as we've seen several times in the past but you know, is that how Ristolainen is seen is he the franchise number one D-man potentially moving forward I don't know if I don't know if the franchise looks at it that way um, but I would certainly hope the fans and other media are recognizing that mm-hmm. because you know a guy that plays that many minutes and plays in all situations and he's you know he's basically the number one power play quarterback now I think before it was supposed to be Cody Franson and Franson's been fine yeah. Uh, but I think with line has taken over, taken over that role there. I mean, it's nice to have both of those guys that can <laughs> take a shot on that, no matter what. You know, get it, get it through crowds and, and get it on that. I think that's great to have. But you know, Risto is the guy that plays in every situation. He's the guy that's that's doing a lot of that hard work, and he's you know by default he's making Josh George's job a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. I think because he's able to take a lot of that pressure off of him and. And, you know, make it easier for, for George to focus on the defensive end of things because, you know, I think that, I, I think, you know, you look at last season, I think he was being asked to do maybe a little bit too much on both sides and that kind of wore him out. I mean, certainly knee injury didn't help out, but, um, but I think now it's, it's made George's, George's job easier and it's made it a little bit easier for some of the depth guys on the fence because, you know, they don't have to play, you know, as many minutes and they don't have to play in some of those, situations or and they get those zone starts where it's works against them. I think I think Risto's made everybody's job a lot easier there. And to me that's the mark of being the number one. You know, you're getting all the work, you're getting all you're getting all the responsibilities heaped upon you and that's where that comes in. It started last season where, you know, you had the team worst plus minus and yeah. you, some people were killing them for it, but it, when you're on a team as bad as that and you're playing a lot of the time, that's gonna happen. 
Yeah, I, I mean, as I said, he, he's been tremendous so far, and, and it all sounds extremely positive with, with him moving forward. And as you said, I mean, it, they brought in Cody Franson to kind of fill this role, and, and he's been surpassed by by this young man. So with Zach Bogosian there as well, if they can get the best out of Bogosian, and he can put the injuries behind him, then that's a pretty decent one-two at least, if not more, with, with other guys who are coming through. So, uh, Joe, thank you very much for, for joining me today. It's been great to catch up with you and, and chat about the Sabres season. They're, they're certainly going to be a fun team to follow moving forward. Yeah, it's good. The, the future certainly seems bright. Just, you know, you have to navigate through the present time to, to realize it's going to only get better. But yeah, it, it's, things are looking up in Buffalo, which I know doesn't sound exactly correct a lot of the time, but that's, uh, but that's certainly the case with the, with the Sabres. Sure. Thanks again, Joe. I'll, I'll speak to you again very soon. Absolutely, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. One. Not short. There we go. Thanks very much to Joe for joining me today. You can follow him on Twitter at Joe Yearden. That's Y-E-R-D-O-N. And of course, you can find him on NHL.com. Just one closing piece that I wanted to comment on. I don't often comment on such things on the podcast. Occasionally we do, but it's the Alex Galchenyuk situation. His partner was arrested as part of a domestic incident at the weekend. Now, what strikes me here is that this is another domestic violence incident within the NHL. And nobody ever likes to see these, you know, it just in general. That does not be about the bush. This is a horrible situation to be in. It's not a nice subject to talk about. But what's concerned me, and I know many others as well, is that somehow Alex Galchenyuk has been... Uh, had to apologise. Why, why is Alex Galchenyuk apologising for, for being a victim here? And it's just this bizarre situation. Why, why is the victim the one in the wrong? And I think hockey needs to, again, look at itself in the mirror here because the Patrick Caton saga was not well handled by the Blackhawks, by the league, by the sport, perhaps. And, and the way some people commented on that and, and dove in with two feet. The Evander Kane news that broke a few weeks ago has maybe disappeared a little bit. But again, you know, what's going on there? We've obviously seen issues with Mike Ribeiro before. And even moving to the past, guys like Bobby Hull off the ice, don't have the cleanest image, the greatest track record, and hockey seems to maybe gloss over these bits some time. And now we have a player in in the, the you know the victim role. I don't want to call it a role; that's a terrible word to use, but but you know what I mean. And he's still in the wrong. He's had to apologise today. What the hell were the Montreal Canadiens thinking, making Alex Galchenyuk apologise for this? It's just absolutely ridiculous. And again, high hockey really needs to take a look at itself in the mirror at how it deals with these situations. It's supposed to be educating players on these sort of issues, and then we get this. It's just bullshit, and it really, really needs to be addressed. There needs to be some serious conversations at the highest level about this, because these incidents cannot keep happening. The handlings of the situations cannot be this tone deaf. People really need to pull their finger out in the NHL boardroom. You know, Gary Bretman's obviously not comfortable talking about this stuff, but unfortunately, he has to. And he's he's a trained lawyer. You know, even if he's uncomfortable, he's smart enough and educated enough to deal with the situation. And at some point, somebody really has to pull their fucking finger out and deal with this. That about wraps it up for this week's show, Rant Over. And you can get in touch with the show at any time. You can follow me on Twitter at robmcgregor35. You can email onepuckshort at gmail.com. You can find the blog, onepuckshort.wordpress.com. There's articles on there at least every other day, if not daily at the moment, trying to keep things rolling on that side of things. You can like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash one put short. If you're an iTunes subscriber, please leave us a review. They help with the show's ratings. They help with great feedback on things you like, things you don't. If you think it's rubbish, fine. You know, say so. Tell us what's wrong. Feedback is important in improving the show. If you're the kind of person who would like to help support One Put Short, there is a PayPal donation button and an Amazon affiliate link on the blog. Click on the PayPal icon, touch the donation page. If you think worth a pound, ten, hundred, whatever. You can donate, it all goes back into running the show. Likewise, the Amazon affiliate link. Click on the Amazon logo, it takes you to Amazon, you shop as normal, you pay at the checkout, it doesn't cost you a penny extra. Once you've paid, we get a little bit of a kickback from Amazon. And again, that's all funneled back into the show and blog. Thanks again to my guest today, Joe Yearden. And there was really only one way I could finish the show. Take care, everybody. I'll speak to you all again very soon.